to climb Rakaposhi Mountain, 25,550 feet high, a mountain which had not been climbed by man before. The expedition was privately organized by the undergraduates of Cambridge who came to Pakistan in the summer of 1954 and along with Pakistani members who joined it, it made an attempt to climb this mountain. This is their story. It was a poor man's expedition. It was entirely a private enterprise and they didn't have many funds either to support them. The expeditions came, part of it by road and part by sea, assembled at, assembled at Karachi and moved to Rawalpindi. We follow the course of the river all the way and it's a pretty hazardous flight. In the distance is Nanga Parbat, a world famous mountain which was climbed by the Germans in 1954. We are getting Gilgit, our destination, and you see these small villages tucked in the mountains all the way. The life is pretty hard for these people. Gilgit Airport is a very small one with a river on one side and mountains on the others. And these aeroplanes just manage to get in and get out. Sometimes these aeroplanes can't even get in. And the arrival of the aeroplanes is always an occasion for celebrations. The local dignitaries, friends, relatives, they all come and receive the passengers who have arrived and there is a bit of a ceremony. Generally, the guard turns out and is received by the dignitary and many other local officials who have come to meet the party. It's a great sight to watch the aeroplane arriving and leaving. The expedition moves to the house of the resident, what you may call the governor of the area. He, live, he has a beautiful house with a lot of fruits and flowers at this time of the year. He is a gentleman in the middle with a white shirt, surrounded by members of the expedition. On his left is George Band, who is one of the finest mountaineers, and on the extreme left with the camera is Dr. Tisa, the leader of the expedition. We were entertained by him, and as a matter of fact, we stayed there at his house. The flowers at this time of the year are in full blossom, and it's extremely picturesque sight around the governor's house. Gilgit Bazaar is world famous. It is the famous caravan route to Kashgar, Central Asia. Now, of course, no longer available to the free world because it's behind the Iron Curtain in Red China. But the bazaar is still full of people, tribes, and men from many parts of Central Asia. The expedition starts from here on its way to Balti. This is the Gilgit River, and the bridge is just wide enough for a jeep to go across it. And the road from there onward is part of the way, r dry riverbed. From here, the road goes up into the hills, and most of this road is made by hand. There's no machinery available, and when there's a big rock like this, they go underneath it, as you notice. The road follows the Hunza River. There's a 
mountain on one side and the deep fast flowing river on the other side. But these drivers are pretty good in driving over such hazardous roads. And in many places there's a danger of falling rocks. They were not Gilgit River. Big speed, which is rather frightening for those who are not used to this kind of roads. And you find often the driver has one foot hanging outside in case something happens, he's ready to jump off. Fortunately, such things don't happen often. In the distance, you see Rakaposhi, the object of the expedition, one of the famous mountains in this part of the region. And this is another type of the bridge used commonly for crossing the Hunza River. You see it's being operated by hand. The bucket carries hardly two persons at a time. It's a pretty slow job, but nothing better is available. In due course, it is hoped that a bridge will be put across here. These Hunza Kotis and, Ni and Naga people are extremely helpful and willing. Roger Charlie and Fraser are riding in the bucket. Fraser, two years later, was killed in Nepal in a mountaineering expedition. Roger Charlie nowadays lives in New York. In the distance, we now see Chalt, which is the summer capital of Mir of Nagar. And that's the view of a glacier showing the way up to the peak Rakaposhi in the distance. This is another type of bridge crossing from Nagar State to Hunza. The Mir of Hunza sent us horses and a party to receive us and escort us to Baltit, the capital of Hunza. The beginning of the road is what you see, and what a rugged road too. When there's a storm or a landslide, the road disappears right down into the river, which you see in the distance. And many people prefer to walk instead of riding a horse, and I don't blame them either. For the hazardous ride you may have to face, unless you are used to it. The local people don't mind, they're quite good at it. They will even gallop on this kind of road. But the members of the expedition were rather frightened, and they preferred to walk, and so you see the horse being led by the man who brought it. Now we are nearing Baltit, the capital of state. Every inch of available land is used for irrigation. The loads were carried on the back by Hunza Kotis, and these boxes were made in England, each weighing 60 pounds, serially numbered. These men would do about 10, 15 miles a day, very happily. Hunza is very fertile, and so is Nagar. But Nagar has more water, and Hunza hasn't got the water. These are the two states on each side of the Hunza River, which divides the two territories. Now you see another kind of bridge. One of the members crossing it, and many a times there are some planks missing. And it's not very easy to cross the river if you're not used to it with missing planks and the bridge. 
and there is one ma- member who is ha- who's having some difficulty in doing it. And there is always a man at the far end waiting for him in case he gets into difficulties. The water is pretty fast at this time, rushing from the mountain tops. The local people are so used to it that they can walk almost with their eyes shut. In the distance is the Golden Peak, still not climbed by man, and it's over 24,000 feet high. It's called Golden Peak because the sun, when it shines against it, gives it a golden effect. The expedition is now arriving at Nagar, the capital of Nagar state, where we were invited by the Mir to be his guest and to attend the harvest festival, which is called Ginani. This is held every year to celebrate the harvest festival. It is like Thanksgiving in the United States. They must get their crops through, collect the fruit, cut the grass, store up for the winter. They have a long winter when the whole country is covered with deep snow and they don't go down into the plains but stay in their homes, shut in with their animal and cattle. The arrival of the party was always a great event in the village. They all the boys and girls and the elders will come and meet the party. School will close and the local band will play music. In the distance, the flag represents the five valleys which are in the state. This is the Mir himself, a very fine horseman, a first-class gentleman, and a great sportsman. And the most hospitable host. The villagers are busy drying fruit. The country is, this time of the year, has tremendous amount of fruit, which is dried in the summer for use in the winter. They grow barley, rice, wheat, corn, all done by hand. No machinery available and not much use for it either because the holdings are very small. It's a pretty slow process, but they don't waste anything. This is the way land has been farmed for thousands and thousands and thousands of years from the dawn of history. And you see this in most parts of the world. There's not much difference whether you see it here or in Japan or in parts of China or many other countries around the globe. The cattle is rather small. It's understandable. There's not much to graze. They're pretty hard worked. The threshing is done by the village as a combined effort of the community because it's not easy for one man to do it. So they all muck in and help one another. Everything is used either by the man, or by the animals, or as a fuel. Nothing is wasted. And they can't do it, can't afford to waste anything with the small amount of land that is available. Nagar is self-sufficient in food. In fact, they have a little bit of surplus which they sell across the river to people in Hunza who do not grow enough food for themselves and have to rely on supplies from Nagar. There's tremendous amount of fruit grown in this area 
apples, apricots, plums, grapes, figs, almonds, walnuts, cherries. And if you get hungry, you just stop, shake the tree, and have a good meal and walk off. No one will charge you, and everyone is welcome to an orchard to help himself when he's hungry. This is the way it's been done. They have so much fruit that they even give it to their animals to feed them. What they can't eat, they store up for the winter, which they must do. But it's delicious fruit. And you find fruit trees all along the roads, everywhere. Nagar is much more fertile than Hunza because they get more water. All the glaciers are on the side in Nagar and not in Hunza, which is dry. The Mira has a beautiful palace high up on top of the ridge with a commanding view of the valley. They don't have any professional fruit pickers. All that you do is make one or two boys to climb the tree and shake it hard, and the rest are busy collecting it. While they're collecting, they're also helping themselves, eating it, so that Mama don't ha won't have to cook anything. The fruit drying is a peculiar process. They take the stone out, and put the fruit in the hot sun to dry, which can be packed up later. But they do something else too. They take the stone, break it, and take the kernel out, and put it back in the fruit so that you can swallow the fruit without any difficulty, any danger of swallowing the stone. They are back putting it back into the fruit. Apricots, mostly, but delicious. I wonder if a machine will ever be invented which can do all this without touching by hand. This is to get the juice out. This is another hand-operated press. You see the house rooftops covered with fruit to be dr for drying. The village workshop is pretty mobile. The man will come and put it down outside the village, operate for a day or two, and then move elsewhere where there's work for him. The economy is run mostly in barter system. He doesn't take any money, but would prefer to take something in kind. And here's a hair comb being made. Using toes and fingers. man in the distance is making a bow. Archery is very popular in this part of the world, and you see little boy and grown-up men all the time walking about with bows and arrows. I wonder if many people will recognize what this man has. There's a pitchfork. And no operation is complete without a smithy. 
The bellows are made of goat skin. The weaver is a pretty busy man at this time of the year. She has to make blankets, even carpets, rough kind, for use in the winter. He even has some patterns and designs, sometimes from magazines from the United States and other countries. And they don't make a bad job of it either. You can order what you want, it'll take some time for, it, for him to make it, but he'll make a try anyhow. There's a lot of wool available, as they have plenty of sheep, goat, yaks in this part of the world. Sometime he'll have his own design, copying some animal or tree or something he has seen or taken fancy to. The shoemaking industry is very much a one-man affair. And this man will come and sit outside your house and make a pair of shoes for you from the local hide and skins which are available. He doesn't take very long to get a pair of shoes made according to the size and design required. He doesn't charge much either for it. In most cases, it's a system which prevails. There's a fine pair of shoes available. Okay. The meter holds his court every now and again, and it is an open court. Anyone can come and listen and attend. He's the supreme commander, he's the supreme judge, he's the king, and he's the father of his people. Children also come and sit in the court when they are doing nothing else and attend what goes on. The country is run by the Quran members of the jury sitting on both sides. Here's a man pleading his case. These cases refer to land and property. There is hardly any crime in this part of the world. There are no lawyers either. The justice is swift and immediate. The members of the court jury give their opinion. The man with the white beard is the prime minister and you see him later on also taking part in many activities. Some litigants are very vocal. This is one of them. A very happy state, and the Mir knows what goes on in his domain. Incidentally, in this court, there is no Fifth Amendment either. The elders form the members of the jury. Sometime a written document is also produced as evidence, which is read out.
There's a tremendous enthusiasm for schools in this area. More and new schools are open every day. There are no buildings for it in many cases, and the school is held in an open space. The education is free. There's one teacher for all. So he just divides them into different grades and different groups. This boy doesn't seem to, he's done his homework. The boy with the coat is the son of the mir and a very fine horseman too, a fine lad, who took great interest in the expedition. Polo originated in this part of the world, and here's a polo team going to the polo field. They play polo in its ancient form, and thousands of villagers come for the harvest festival in great processions with bands and flags and polo sticks and horses and shouting and yelling and music going on all the time. Every village has a polo team and the band of course is always in attendance and all, at all these functions and as usual children standing behind watching the fun. They wear fancy clothes too for the occasion. The mere is the host for everyone. He feeds them for these two, two days, and the food is centrally cooked, a yak is slaughtered every day, and everybody is Mir's guest for these days. No one goes hungry, there's plenty for everyone. The Prime Minister supervises the distribution of food. The girls watch the fun from the top of the ridge, and they get a wonderful commanding view. The polo match is in full swing. The main street of the village is converted into polo field, and it's free for all. If you miss the ball, you can hit the pony, and you miss the pony, you can hit the riders. And for our sake, the score was put in English on a blackboard, which was taken from the school. You can even pick up the ball and run with it, but there's a danger of receiving some polo hits on the head. Archery from a galloping horse is another popular sport in this part of the world. There's a white marker to be shot at. There's Amir coming himself. He's almost got it. The Prime Minister now has a turn at it. They say it's good for the drums to be warmed up. Produces apparently better music. Tent pegging is another event. There's the mir coming now with a lance in his hand and a small peg which is buried in ground and it is to be picked up from a galloping horse. And he's picked, he's got his peg. This man got his one too. Different types of drums, you see. And now the inevitable dancing. You will notice that the dancers are all men. And different dances will be performed by different people. And the Prime Minister again taking part in one of them, wearing a rather handsome coat.
some are slow and some are fast and some are solo and some are many join. Sword dance is the next event. It is very popular and these are real swords and pretty sharp. But these men are expert at handling these. And it's not one sword but two swords with which they dance. One in each hand. The children love these shows. The schools are closed. Because these children expect to be to do these things themselves when they grow up. Has our friend the Prime Minister again. He's pretty old, but he doesn't know how old he is. But he's in fine state of health. There are no birth certificates maintained, so it's difficult to know the age of a man. He can only guess. It's a pretty rugged country, but you see terraced fields all over the place. And the Hunza River cutting through on the way to join the Gilgit River near Gilgit. This is the most common type of bridge made of rope. And the rope is made from branches of trees intertwined consists of three parts, one on which you walk and one on either side for the hands to hold. And it can take hardly two men at a time. We asked them how often they renew the bridge and the answer was when it breaks. They last, I believe, a season. It's not very easy to walk across this type of bridge. The expedition is now on its way to the mountain. And this is the first stage of it, having crossed the bridge on the way to Joglode, which was the first village. We had about 60 coolies, but we are going higher and higher now, crossing these streams on the way with cold, icy cold, rushing water. Many of these men would bring their burrow for carrying loads in addition to what he carries himself. We were going higher and higher now. And there were 60 coolies to carry the load of the expedition. Wild flowers were in full blossom at this time of the year. And we are now almost reaching the end of the tree line.
having done, climbed about 10,000 feet. The track is like a goat track, very narrow, steep, and going uphill all the time. We have passed Jaglot village, which is the last big village, and now entering Darbar, where we camp for the night. And this is before getting to the base camp. There are no more villages now, and this is the first base camp which the expedition established, about 12,000 feet high. In the distance is the glacier, rising towards Rakaposhi. We were fortunate to find a plateau like this with a stream running through where the tents were pitched and the baggage was sorted out. The coolies were sent back home and the porters who were to stay with us started the work on their own. We were fortunate in finding a Hunza who said he was a cook. It took him some time to, to know what cooking was, but I must say that he was extremely intelligent. In no time he became pretty efficient in cooking most of the things that were needed. Making a chapati, which is like a pancake, there were six porters. Two of them had been with the German expedition before and knew something about, about high altitude. The rest came for the first time, but it wasn't very difficult for them to get climatized and climb Kenshinchanga. We decided to change the base camp and make a different approach. And so we shifted to another place, and this is the second base camp, which was 14,000 feet high. We had a stream running through the camp, where water started flowing at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. When you are on a mountain, there's hardly any privacy between the members. George Band getting a haircut from David Fisher. Incidentally, he's one of the finest climbers in the world, having climbed Everest, Kinchinchanga, and many other peaks. The doctor is a very busy man. He happened to be leader also. And there's always a tremendous number of people who come to the doctor for help. The villagers were always coming, every day coming, to ask for medicine and kept him pretty busy. Having established base camp, we moved to Camp 1, which was 15,000 feet high. The mountains in this part of the world are quite different from anywhere else. They rise steep. See our porters, still carrying a lot of baggage to Camp One. We pass a tree line. We kept a few coolies to help us to Camp 1, which wasn't very far.
This is now moving to Camp 2, 17,000 feet high. A rope had to be fixed to make it easier, especially for the porters. This was a, at the end of a gully, and there was always rocks coming down, which made it rather dangerous. Camp 3 was established about 19,000 feet high. The snow was deep. And you can see the result of it that was pretty hard going. There are two members in the distance, nearing the top, who gone ahead. Surakaposhi in the distance, to the right is the monk's head, which was our next objective. There wasn't much room for camps on them at this place, but we were able to flatten out a piece of ground and make a dump of stores. From Camp 2, we were able to get some wonderful view. It's moving from Camp 3 to Camp 4, which was about 19,000 feet, and going around a cornice. This is where the expedition met its first misfortune, Rangam and one other porter, as they were going over a cornice, having gone there before, the day before, they met a disaster. The cornice broke and Rangam fell down about 60 feet and he had to be retrieved later on with the help of the others when they arrived. But this put him and the porter out of action. They had to be evacuated all the way back to the base camp. In the distance is Monk's head. We're trying to get there to establish camp four and five. By this time, the members are getting tired and weary. For well, the hard going, and strenuous work involved. With Rangam and two porters having gone, we had another unfortunate episode now that the bad weather started. and it lasted several days, which forced us to abandon the peak and come back. But the expedition achieved one thing, that they climbed highest than any other expedition before and found a route which is possible to get to Rakapochi, and there is a mountain still unclimbed. There is one thing which is outstanding about Rakaposhi, that it is a gentleman mountain. It has never taken life of the climbers that have attempted to climb it.